All right, The Wondrous Life of Joseph. This is actually study number 10, and uh, we are going to look at parts of two chapters. We're not going to look at the entirety of 46 and 47, but parts of 46 and 47. Uh, parts of those chapters I'm just going to summarize, and, and, um, and you'll see why as we get into it in just a, a second. All right, this was last uh, week's chapter, chapter 45, uh, that we covered. And, well, this is a summarization of it, a summary of it. So Joseph is very affected by the change in his brothers, especially in the change in Judah, because Judah had led the effort to sell him into slavery 22 years before, and now Judah is doing everything he can to save Benjamin, and even said that he would take the place of Benjamin as a slave in Egypt if Benjamin could go home. So Joseph's very affected by all that, getting kind of emotional, as I'm about to get, <laughs> not, not in the way Joseph did. Um, Joseph, he, 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 he decides, okay, because the whole deal with the test was if they had changed, he's going to reveal himself to them and then show them great mercy. Uh, now, if they hadn't changed, everything would have been different. Don't know exactly what would have happened, but... My guess is, is Benjamin would have stayed as a slave. All the brothers would have left, left him there if they had abandoned him there, Benjamin. I think Joseph would have revealed himself uh, to Benjamin, his little brother, and Benjamin would have stayed there in Egypt with uh, the Lord of Egypt. And things would have been much different, obviously. But the brothers had changed, uh, so that doesn't have to happen. And so he reveals himself to his 11 brothers, and he says, I am Joseph, and he says it in Hebrew, and that's the first Hebrew expression they had heard from him. His brothers find themselves very shocked and frightened, as I would have been too in their situation. And uh, Joseph tells them that what they meant for evil, God had meant for good, for the saving of many lives. And Joseph shows them great kindness and tells them that they should go back to Canaan, the land of Canaan, uh, and go back to Jacob and their families and then bring everybody back to Egypt. And Joseph said, bring them here. I will look after them in the best part of Egypt. And the brothers returned to Canaan, and they announced the news to Jacob, who's also called Israel. All right, so tonight, our first chapter that we're going to spend a little time in is Genesis chapter 46. And if you want to look at verse 1 of chapter 46. So Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba, and he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. All right, Beersheba. He's living in just outside of Hebron. This is where the household of Jacob is in the land of Canaan. Uh, it's just north of Hebron. It's, it's in a place called Mamre, and that's where they are, and this is where they're departing from. And so they are beginning, the household of Jacob is beginning their trip to Egypt, uh, but they stop at a place called Beersheba, and they offer sacrifices there. Now, why did they stop at Beersheba? Well, while the covenant household, Abraham's household, and that's kind of the, the name of Abraham's household, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham was the beginning of, of God's covenant people on the earth. And, uh, and then he had a son, Isaac. And so Isaac inherited the entire household of Abraham when Abraham died. And then Jacob inherited the entire household of Abraham and Isaac uh, when Isaac passed away. And most of the time they were up at Mamre, in the Hebron area. Uh, but sometimes they would spend time down in Beersheba too. And as you go through the book of Genesis, you see at times that they're down there living in Beersheba. So most of the time at Hebron, uh, but sometimes down in Beersheba. And so he stops at Beersheba, this place that they had lived over the years uh, off and on. Now, why did he do that? Well, because some important events took place in Beersheba when they were living there. Um, Abraham was sometimes at Beersheba, and we're told that he dug a well there, which may not seem like a big deal to us, but in the Bible, that's if you dig a well somewhere, it, that's very, very important. He did that. He planted a tree, a specific tree to kind of mark the spot. down in Be And this was Abraham down in Beersheba. And we're told that he called on God there in Beersheba too. So that means he built an altar and he, and he offered sacrifices to God there. And God may have spoken to him there in Beersheba. Well, we know that he did on, on certain occasions. 
Abraham was living down in Beersheba when he was told by God to travel north to Moriah and offer Isaac as a burnt offering. And you remember that from the, the book of Genesis where he, is, he thinks he's going to have to offer Isaac as a burnt offering, but at the last minute there's a, a ram, a male sheep, that substituted uh, for Isaac. And Moriah is Jerusalem. You see it up there at the very top. It wasn't called Jerusalem back in Abraham's day, though. Uh, the Lord appeared to Isaac, uh, Abraham's son Isaac, in Beersheba. Uh, and this is recorded in Genesis chapter 26. Then he went up from there to Beersheba, Isaac, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, and he called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Also, Isaac is living in Beersheba when he gives his blessing to Jacob. If you remember, Rebekah had to trick Isaac into giving the blessing to, to Jacob. Uh, God said that Jacob was supposed to get the blessing, but Isaac wanted to give it to his favorite son, Esau. Uh, and so Rebekah steps in, saves the day, because it was God's will for Jacob to get it, and um, sends in uh, Jacob, who's dressed up like Esau, and has to trick Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob. And this happens at Beersheba as well. Uh, so it's a very, very important place. This is why Jacob stops there to pray and worship God before he goes to Egypt. Uh, I mean, if something like this happened in your family or my family, uh, let's say you were living up here in Huntsville, uh, but sometimes we live down in Coleman. And in Coleman, God had revealed himself uh, to us down there, to our family, and, and kind of given us tasks, made promises to us. It, it would become a very important place, the interaction that we had with God taking place in Coleman, it would be very important. So we're down there sometimes, most of the time we're in Huntsville. Uh, but then what we're, what's gonna happen is we're gonna move to Arizona and, and we're gonna drive there. Well, we're gonna head south and we're gonna stop in Coleman before we go to Arizona. How long are we gonna be gone in Arizona for? We don't know. And so we're gonna go and we're gonna pray there just like, uh, just like Jacob was doing because of the important things that had happened down in that place in our family. Same exact thing, that's why they stopped in Beersheba. All right, look at verse 2. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. All right, so that's where they are. This is still in Beersheba. They haven't left Beersheba yet. And uh, so it looks like after a day of prayers and sacrifices in Beersheba, uh, Jacob goes to sleep there in Beersheba. And in the night, God speaks to him and tells him, don't be fearful about going to Egypt. God says, it's my will that you, go, you and your family go to Egypt. And so as you think about it, you see that happening. God knows the heart of Jacob. So it looks like Jacob might have had some doubt about going uh, into Egypt, leaving Canaan and going to Egypt. Um, although he was very much looking forward to seeing Joseph. You know, you know Joseph is there, there waiting for him. He's looking forward to seeing Joseph. And he likes the prospects of his family living in a place where there's food, knowing that there are five years left in the famine. So this is a good place to go. His son is there and running the country, and also there's food there, and he's taking his entire family and all the animals to Egypt. So he likes all that. Um, but I think he's a little nervous about leaving the land of Canaan because God had brought his grandfather, Abraham, to the land of Canaan from the city of Ur. And, and when Abraham got there in the city of Shechem, which is a city in, in the land of Canaan, uh, God spoke to Abraham and said, you know, this land you're standing on, Abraham, now I'm going to give it to your descendants. I'm going to make of you a great nation, and I'm going to give this land to your descendants. This will be where your nation is in the land of Canaan. And Abraham hears that. He builds an altar and worships God after he hears that sort of thing. And so that was a big deal. So God had revealed himself to Abraham and told him these things. And then God had reaffirmed these promises to Isaac and then again to Jacob. So God told Abraham, it's you. Your descendants are going to have this land. You're going to have a lot of descendants, and they are going to have this land of Canaan. 
and then Isaac. Same thing. Isaac, this promise is coming down through you. Your descendants are going to have this land. You have lots of descendants, and they're going to have the land of Canaan. And then Jacob had the same thing. God reaffirmed the promises to Jacob as well. And it was all about the land of Canaan. Uh, so I think it felt a little odd to Jacob to be leaving the place. Didn't make much sense to him. And he was, man, is this the right thing to do? And then God comes to him and tells him, this is the right thing to do. He needed to hear that, and, and he heard it. All right. It, it, this is interesting. Um, I had a guy years ago uh, tell me, I mean, a long time ago, and he really didn't know much about the Bible. Uh, really smart guy uh, otherwise, though, and just uh, traveled a lot. And he says, you know, I think God took the, the people of Israel, the Jews, into Egypt so they could kind of see how a nation was operating before God took them to Canaan and they became a nation. And I, I said, that's, that's kind of interesting. I think that may be part of what was going on here. Obviously, Moses is going to be educated the first 40 years of his life. Moses is going to spend in the household of Pharaoh, and he's going to have a royal education, uh, just like any of the other princes would have. Uh, he had that because he was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. And, and, and so he learned a lot, and then God used that as Moses became the leader of the new nation, the nation of Israel. So I, I think there's something to that. So God says, it's my plan. He tells Jacob, it's my plan. I'm going to form the household of Jacob into a great nation while they're in Egypt. This is where they're going to turn into a nation. They're going to go from just a household into a nation, a large nation. And then he's going to take that nation out of the land of Egypt and give them land uh, for the nation to operate on. So God had promised Abraham that he would give him many descendants and make him a great nation. There are other promises too, but those are two core promises. Many descendants and make you into a great nation. And those same promises, again, repeated to Isaac, repeated to Jacob. Uh, now Jacob hears that moving his family to Egypt is part of God's plan to do that, to build them into this nation, the nation of Jacob, the nation of Israel. The Lord also, in this passage, what we just read, the Lord also tells Jacob that he, God, will go down to Egypt with Jacob and will one day bring him back to Canaan. And he tells Jacob that Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. So God's going to go with Jacob down to Egypt. Um, and so Jacob has an understanding because the first, first encounter that Jacob had with God was at a city called Bethel. Jacob was young and he was leaving his household. He was leaving Beersheba and he was going up to live with his uncle. <laughs> and this is where he gets married and so much happens uh, up there with his, at his uncle's house. Uh, but on the way up there, he stops in Bethel. It wasn't called uh, Bethel. It was a Canaanite city, and they had their own name for it. Uh, but he stayed the night outside that city, and he put his head down on a rock. He would have cushioned it with his tunic, I'm sure, his coat. Uh, and that night he has a vision, and God, God is up in heaven, and there's a, a ladder, sometimes it's called that. The Hebrew really is a staircase. And angels are going up and down the staircase to, from where Jacob is up to the throne of God in heaven. And this is when God tells Jacob, you're my man. Just like Abraham was my man and your dad Isaac was my man, now you're my man. And that's the first time he heard that. And he got affirmation on that. He liked to hear it too. And he woke up the next morning and he basically says, I didn't know God lived here. And so he starts calling the place Bethel, which means house of God. And that became the nickname of that Canaanite city. And later on, when Joshua takes the land of Canaan, they, they take that city of, of Lutz and they actually changed the name to Bethel, what they've been calling it that for years as a nickname. But there was almost this idea that Jacob thought, this is where God was. You know, God, he didn't have, it didn't seem like he had this idea that God was big and everywhere. You know, omnipresent is the theological word for it. Uh, <clears throat> But now, as he, obviously, as he's been living his life and, and walking with God, Jacob comes to understand that God is omnipresent, all-knowing, he's everywhere, uh, that sort of thing. And this just backs it up. Yeah, you're going to Egypt, but I'll be there too. This is what he's telling Jacob. And Jacob needed to hear that. And I think it probably brought him a lot of comfort. And then one day, God will bring Jacob back to the land of Canaan. He's going to bring him back to the land of Canaan. Bring it back there. Now, 
There are two senses to this idea of bringing Jacob back to the land of Canaan. He's going to bring his body back to the land of Canaan when Jacob dies. Jacob will die in Egypt, uh, but he won't be buried there. He's going to be buried back in the land of Canaan. So Jacob's body will be brought back to the land of Canaan after he dies. Now, eventually, Jacob will die, like I said, and Joseph will be there. And Joseph will put his hands on Jacob's eyes. In other words, Joseph will close Jacob's eyes after he dies. So this is, this is all comforting to, he's an old man at this point. He's 130 years old when he's going into Egypt. And he's being told God's going to go there with him. Um, his, he'll be brought back to Canaan. He's not going to be buried there in the land of Egypt. Your son Joseph, whom you're very much looking forward to seeing again, he will be there with you when you die. You, you won't be alone. You'll be with him. And because he's going to close your eyes after you pass. That's what that means. That's what that is referring to. And then, as we'll find out later, Joseph will lead a grand funeral procession that will take the body of Jacob from Egypt back to the land of Canaan and to the cave of Machpelah. The cave of Machpelah. Now, since I can't go to Israel right now, and it's driving me insane, obviously, um, I thought I'd put a picture of me in Israel at the cave of Machpelah. And this is the cave of Machpelah is underneath this stru this structure, and I've talked about this structure before. I'm fascinated with it uh, because Abraham bought a place to bury Sarah when she died, and he buried her in this cave of Machpelah. And then when Abraham died, he was buried in there. When Isaac died, he was buried in that cave. When Rebecca, Isaac's uh, wife, died, she was buried in there. Uh, Leah is in there, and uh, Jacob will be the last one to go in. And it's that cave structure is under this structure that you see here. The structure you see was built by Herod the Great uh, in the first century BC. And there it is, it's still there. Massive stones. And but underneath that is the cave structure, the cave of the patriarchs and matriarchs. Uh, it's the second holiest site in Judaism. Uh, the Western Wall in Jerusalem is the first holiest site. This is the second. Uh, but you're standing there, I'm like, Joseph was here. All the brothers were there because for the funeral procession, they all came in. Obviously, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and, and Rebecca, and Jacob and Leah. You think about the people that were there. There was a bunch of uh, the leadership from Egypt that came to that funeral, too. And they were all there. So fascinating history. Fascinating. So that's the first sense of it. Uh, I'm going to bring you back to the land of Canaan. When you die, you're going to be brought back here and buried with your fathers. The second sense of things is this. God will one day bring Jacob's offspring, the nation of Israel, out of Egypt and lead them to the land of Canaan, the promised land. Uh, they go down to Mount Sinai first, and they're down there for almost a year. And then they go, and they're supposed to go right into the promised land, right into the land of Canaan and take it. Uh, but they don't, and it's 40 years later before they actually go in. But uh, that's the second sense, the day when God will bring Jacob's offspring out of Egypt and lead them to the land of Canaan. Those are the two senses when God says, I'm going to bring you back to Canaan. All right. All right. Look at verse five. Jacob arose from Beersheba and the sons of Israel carried their father, Jacob, their little ones and their wives and the carts, which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan. And they went to Egypt, Jacob and all of his descendants with him his sons and his son's sons, his daughters and his son's daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. This would have really been something to see. This would have been a grand caravan that was making its way from Canaan to the land of Egypt because Abraham's household was huge. It got bigger under Isaac. It's gotten bigger under Jacob. So it's a massive amount of people that are coming over to Egypt. All right, so Jacob arose the next morning. At, in Beersheba, after having that affirmation from God, yeah, this is the right thing to do, to go into the land of Egypt. It's good. It's my will. So he's got renewed confidence about this whole thing, and he's encouraged. And so there they go. They're going toward Egypt. Now, this, like I said, that would have been quite a sight to see. And the old man Jacob is riding in one of the Egyptian carts. Remember, the Pharaoh sent carts uh, to transport uh, a lot of the people back from Canaan to, to Egypt. And so these Egyptian cards, it would have been amazing to see what those look like. 
And so Jacob is riding in one of them, and all the women and little children ride in Egyptian carts too. And they're moving toward Egypt with a lot of livestock, a lot of goods, and a lot of servants. All right, look at the first part of verse 8. Now these were the names of the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt. All right, so that's the first part. This is a part I'm just going to kind of summarize. Verses 8 through 25, here's what goes on in those verses. They list the sons of Jacob in each of his sons' sons. It lists the sons born to Leah first and the sons of the sons born to Leah. And then it does the very same thing with Leah's maidservant, Zilpah. And then it does the same with Rachel. And then it does the same with Rachel's maidservant, Bilhah. So it gives, it gives the names of the sons and the sons' sons. All right, now down to verse 26. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. That's just listing the people who actually came from Jacob's body, uh, which, which, is, which is interesting. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but he's saying, well, it says 66 and then it says 70. Uh, here's what it's doing. Uh, it, when it says 66, this list includes 12 sons. 52 grandsons, four great-grandsons, and two daughters. And that gets you to 70 people. But then you have to take out some people who were born but were still not alive. Ur and Onan. Remember those were Judah's two sons, his, his two oldest sons that he had who were wicked? They died in Canaan. And then you had Manasseh and Ephraim. Those are Joseph's two sons who are already in Egypt. So you take those four away and you reduce the 70 children uh, to 66. 70 children of Jacob to 66. So that's the 66 number. And then the 70 number, this is arrived by adding Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's two sons to the total. <laughs> so it gets you back to, to 70. It's just a little, I guess it's just a brain exercise. In case you're falling asleep as you're reading the Bible, you hit this and it's like working a crossword puzzle or something. He's like, what in the world? Is going on here but that was the clearest explanation of it uh, that that I could find and maybe that's not even clear to you uh, but um, then the main thing is is just saying it's right at 70 people who were in Egypt who were in the land of Egypt when Jacob crosses over the border with everybody and comes in the people that were there who came from his body numbered 70 these are that actually came from him that doesn't count any of the servants or any of the sons wives or anything like that because they didn't come from Jacob's body all right, verse 28. Then he sent, Jacob, sent Judah before him to, to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. All right, so as they're approaching, as they're getting close, uh, Jacob says to Judah, go ahead, go ahead of us, because they're moving slow. they got a lot of animals they're moving, a lot of people. And he says, Judah, go ahead and go to uh, Joseph and find out exactly the location that we're supposed to be heading to, where we're going to be settling. After they arrive there, Joseph rides in on his chariot and presents himself to his father. And it's an emotional scene. I mean, it's been 22 years since they last saw one another. And uh, there's a lot of crying, a lot of weeping, a lot of hugging uh, going on. It would have been something to see. Now, Jacob says to Joseph, I can die in peace now because you're still alive. It's blowing my mind. And I can see your face. Not only are you still alive, I get to see you and hug you. And so I can die in peace now. Now, this a commentator said this. I'll just read uh, what he wrote. I thought it was really, really nice. It's only fitting that Judah who bore the responsibility for separating Joseph from Jacob, should now be charged with arranging their reunion. I thought I, 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 that's something I hadn't noticed. That that's exactly right. Judah is responsible for separating Joseph from his father Jacob, and now he rides ahead and he kind of gets everything set up for their 
reunion. All right, verse 31. And then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock. And they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? That you shall say, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. All right, so Goshen, this is the area that I've circled there. That, that's basically the area of Goshen in Egypt. And it's Joseph's plan for his family to dwell there. He wants them to, to live in Goshen. Now, Goshen has a lot of land for pasture, and, and uh, Jacob's family has a lot of livestock. They have a lot of sheep, a lot of goats, a lot of cows. And so they, they're going to need land for that. Um, but there's also some other reasons he wants to get them to Goshen too, which we'll look at in, in just, just a minute. So Joseph, pre he prepares his brothers. He talks with his brothers and he says, okay, you guys are going to go meet with Pharaoh and here's what you need to say. And he makes sure that they got down what they are going to say when they get into Pharaoh's presence. They might be nervous and everything. So here's what you're going to say. When Pharaoh speaks to them, they're to be very clear with him that they deal in livestock. And, and that they're shepherds and they're, they're, they're a mixture. They take care of cows. They take care of uh, uh, flocks and herds. They also take care of sheep and, and goats. So <clears throat> every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. And nobody really understands why that is. There's speculation, but I, I read a lot on it. And most of the Bible commentators said, we don't know why they looked down or, or kind of looked badly upon shepherds and those who deal or dealt with animals. Um, but they did, and they had to have them. You had to have shepherds, and you had to have ranchers and that sort of thing, uh, and, but most of them were up in the Goshen area. That's where they put them, uh, and that was kind of away from the general, uh, general population of uh, the other Egyptians. Um, so they were kind of separated from the general population, and Joseph wants that. He wants his family separated from the general population. He doesn't want them intermingling too much with the Egyptians and inter maybe intermarrying with them because Joseph fully knows in his mind, in his heart, that God had said he is going to make the descendants of Abraham into a specific nation. And the nation is going to be built off of the descendants of, of Jacob, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knows that. And so he wants to get them into a place where God will do what he's doing, building the nation, where they're kind of in their own area. And so Jews are growing up marrying other Jews, that sort of thing. This is what he's up to. Now, he has an Egyptian wife with two kids, but that, he, that's not, that, that was a specific situation, a unique situation. In general, you've, Jewish boys need to grow up and marry Jewish girls. And typically, they stayed within their own tribes, too. Whatever tribe, if you were in the tribe of Judah, you typically married a, a woman. If you're a guy, you married a woman from the tribe of Judah. And it goes with all the other tribes as well. That's the way the things kind of worked out. So he, this, remember, he's a man who plans, and, and he's got a plan for everything. Joseph does. And so he, he sees the big picture. And what I love about Joseph is if he knows God has said something, he fully believes God's going to do it. So God has said, I'm going to make a nation out of your descendants. So Joseph just totally assumes that's what God's going to do. So what should I do to kind of help the cause? And I'm, I'm get everybody, all of my family into Goshen here, separated from the general population of Egypt. So that's kind of what's going on. All right. <clears throat> so he prepares his brothers for the meeting to make that happen. Now we're going to go down, we're going to go down to uh, chapter 47 and, and look at some passages from that chapter. Starting in verse 1. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess, have come here from the land of Canaan, and indeed they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? 
And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. Okay, so Joseph, this is interesting, he picks five of his brothers. He does, he's not going to take all 11 of them up there. He's going to take five. We're not, we're not told who he chose. Uh, but I think he chose the ones that he felt would represent the family well before the Pharaoh. And as the brothers stand before the Pharaoh, he does just what Joseph said Pharaoh was going to do. What is your occupation? They said, we're shepherds and herdsmen. And then they humbly asked to dwell in the land of Goshen. And um, now Joseph would have been interpreting this. Joseph standing there, the brothers would have been talking. Joseph would have talked to Pharaoh. Pharaoh would have talked. Joseph would have talked to his brothers. He's, he's translating Egyptian to Hebrew. He's the one doing that. Now that's sweet because he can make sure everything's worded as it needs to, as it comes from the brothers to Pharaoh, you know, uh, because Pharaoh doesn't know uh, Hebrew and he's just trusting Joseph. So he's got that taken care of too. Pharaoh then speaks to Joseph and says that his brothers, his father, they can have the best of the land of Egypt, and that's up there in the land of Goshen, and that'll work well because they're shepherds, they're herdsmen. He also tells Joseph, this is interesting, that if any of the men of his family are competent, and what that means is really good shepherds, really good herdsmen, and leaders, good leaders, that Joseph hire those guys and put them over my shepherds and herdsmen. And so the whole idea is Pharaoh's thinking, man, if any of these brothers are like this guy, Joseph, if any of them are even close to him, I want them in my service. And so he makes sure he takes care of that. All right, verse 7. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? <laughs> And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not yet attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. So it's interesting because to kind of take care of where they're going to live and everything, he just brings his brothers in. And they take care of that kind of business, things that Pharaoh needs to give to them, a you know, place to live and, and take care of all that. And then he kind of leaves his father for the next audience where that stuff's already taken care of. And it can just be two men, honorable men, Pharaoh and Jacob, talking to one another. And this would have been something to see. You have, you have the founding father, basically, Abraham and Isaac, obviously, but Jacob and his 12 sons. And the nation of Israel is the nation of Israel. That's Jacob. It's the nation of Jacob. But his name got changed to Israel. That's what all that is. So you've got like the, the founding father per, pretty much of the nation of Israel sitting there talking to the leader of Egypt back about 1,800 years before Christ. You know, in these countries, we still talk about these two countries today, Israel and Egypt. And we have for a very, very long time. That is fascinating. Uh, Jacob doesn't simply say, I'm 130. He doesn't say that. He says, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. And he says, and few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And he says, yet they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. He's talking about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac uh, lived uh, a lot longer. I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. All right, so uh, Father Ronald Knox, uh, who was in, was in England, a convert to Catholicism, he became a priest, uh, lived in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s. He actually uh, has a, a version of the Bible uh, that he produced, and I read that a lot. I, I, he works, I love the way he works things. And, and this is, I don't know if you can see it, I'll read it. But um, in this passage, and when the king asked him, when Pharaoh asked Jacob, what was his age? 
I have lived a wanderer's life, said he, these hundred and thirty years. No long life and no happy one compared with the years my father spent roaming the world before me. Jacob saw his life as a pilgrimage on the earth, a, a journey through the earth to another place. That's how he looked at it. It wasn't like, here's how old I am. It's like, here's how many years I've spent on this pilgrimage to the other place where I'm going. And he's honest about what the journey has been like. And he says, although 130 years may sound like a, a long time, it wasn't long compared to my father's. Abraham lived to be 175 and Isaac lived to be 180. <coughs> so he would still have 50 years to live if he was going to live as long as his father Isaac had lived. And I said Jacob was honest about his life because he just says, you can hear an old Jewish man saying this. Yeah, I've been around a lot of Jewish people um, living in Southeast Florida, Boca Raton. Oh my. Uh, I spent two hours one night in Boca Raton with a rabbi from South Africa uh, because down the street from us in Boca Raton, there was a young couple. Uh, it was a Jewish couple and they were super nice. Uh, and they were so so interesting in their accents. Those South African accents are so interesting. And uh, and then one day her father came to visit from South Africa and he's rabbi. And we he and I talked for two hours in my my front yard. It was a townhome we were living in at the time, and it was just absolutely fascinating. Um, but I, I just can hear and I can see his spirit, Jacob's spirit, 130 year old Jewish man, and he's in there, no happy one, you know. I mean, he's just telling the truth. You're hearing exactly how he's, he's feeling. It's 130 years, but it hasn't been very happy. Now, what is he talking about? Well, old Jacob here, you think about what, and this is just some of the stuff. I was just reflecting on what he had gone through in his life. He had to trick his father into receiving the blessing. His father didn't say, Jacob, my boy, I'm going to give you the blessing. Uh, he had to trick him because his father was going to give it to, to Esau, his twin brother. So that's kind of interesting. His brother, Esau, wanted to kill him for a number of years. He lived with his crafty father-in-law, Laban, for many years. And Laban, his father-in-law, switched daughters on Jacob on his wedding night. And Jacob wound up with Leah instead of his beloved Rachel. He did receive Rachel as a wife also afterwards, seven days later. But it wasn't the same. You know, this is kind of interesting way to go into your, your marriage. With four different women who were somewhat competitive, he had 12 sons and one daughter. He had to escape from his father-in-law's house with his family, and his father-in-law chased him down with the intent to do harm. Um, but God stopped that. Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord and was permanently injured by the experience. He had, after that night of wrestling with the angel, he had a limp from that point on for the rest of his life. His daughter, Dinah, was raped by the prince of Shechem. His only daughter was raped. His ten oldest sons, without Jacob knowing that they were going to do this, they attacked Shechem, killed all the men, and took all the women and children. And he was very upset about all that. Then his beloved son, Joseph, goes missing, and Jacob thinks that he's dead. And Jacob had grieved deeply over the missing son, Joseph, gone every year since it happened. Then the famine hit Canaan, and he had to send his sons into Egypt. And there was trouble after trouble with all of that. Nothing is easy. So he says, yeah, I've lived 130 years. This has been my pilgrimage. No happy one. <laughs> now, of course, there's been some happiness mixed in there. Um, but right now he's kind of... Pessimistic a little bit at 130. So they have a chat. I don't think everything that they talked about is recorded. We're just told. But it's also interesting. When he comes in there, uh, Jacob blesses the Pharaoh, gives him a blessing. They have their conversation. And when he's leaving, he blesses the Pharaoh again. All right, look at verse 11. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all of his father's household with bread, according to the number in their families. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're talking, this is the area, again, this is the area of Goshen. 
Um, and you can kind of see some of the cities that were later on developed more in the area, but they're out in the grasslands. This is the Nile Delta where it splits before it goes into the Mediterranean because it flows north. And uh, there's, there's water, so there's, there's growth in that area. I don't know what things were like right now with the famine, uh, but after the famine, that would be just a, a, a great place to live, especially if you had cattle and you had flocks. All right, so the land of Goshen here is called the land or the region of Ramses. This is the region of Cantor or Tanis in the northeastern delta of the Nile. The household of Jacob settles here in Goshen. And it's some of the best land in Egypt. Don't know, like I said, what it's like now with the famine. This, the famine is severe, but it will be. And it will be perfect for their flocks and herds and to grow crops later on. And uh, it's also, like I said, a bit separated from the general Egyptian population, which is good. They can kind of all stay together as Jews. As they get bigger, this is where they're going to stay the entire time. They're going to be in Egypt for 430 years. It's a long time. And there's going to be millions of them by the time Moses leads them out. So Joseph gets his family settled in the area and provides them with grain. Now, what a feeling this must have been, because for the last two years, they've been in the land of Canaan. The severe famine is going on. You know how you would have felt if you were a dad, a mom, grandparent, the worry that you would have because you kept running out of food and there was no food around. And so you had to go to Egypt and get it. But to have spent the last few years in Canaan worried to death about food and your family and starvation, now you're set up in Egypt, a land that has food, and your every need is being taken care of by the Lord of Egypt. The peace that must have brought uh, to them in their hearts. Now, as I read that, I couldn't help think that that's an image of heaven because after this life that we're going through, this pilgrimage that we're on right now, sometimes... Sometimes it's not a happy one, right? With all of its sadness and uncertainty, all that stuff we face down here, uh, we will one day be in the Father's house with our every need taken care of, not by the Lord of Egypt, but by the Lord of Lords. And Jesus makes that clear in a couple of passages. This one, I think it comes out really nicely. He tells his followers, don't let your heart be troubled. You believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. He's, he's saying, I'm not lying to you. <laughs> they're, they're really there. There are dwelling places for you in my Father's house. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And this is one of the areas that I kind of focused on last week, that Joseph wanted everybody, his family, to be where he was. Come to me in Egypt. I'll take care of you. And that's exactly what we see Jesus. Is Jesus wants his people where he is. And Joseph wanted his father and his family to hear of his glory in Egypt. And you hear the same thing with, with Jesus. It's just we're to go and tell people about the glory of Jesus. And we're to come see it for ourselves. And we're, we're to be where Jesus is. He wants us where he is. And that's really, really good stuff. That's so comforting. All right. So, and then you get to Genesis chapter 47, verses 13 to through uh, 26, verses 13 through 26, and I'm just going to summarize uh, these verses. All right, so the famine is severe. They, after they get to Egypt, there's still five years left in the famine. So the famine's severe, and the people of Egypt, we're, we're told what's going on in the rest of the country. We, we found out what happens with the Jews. They're settled. The Hebrews are settled in Goshen. What's going on with the Egyptians and the rest of the land of Egypt? Well, the people of Egypt spend, we're told they spend all their money buying grain from Joseph. They have to pay for it. It's not, it's not, like, a, it's not like we had you know, the checks we were receiving during the pandemic, just dropping them into our, pay, into our bank accounts. Uh, they, they, it wasn't like grain was just dropped in. They had to pay for it, and they spent all their money buying grain from Joseph. And all the money went to Pharaoh. Joseph had it, and he gave it to Pharaoh. The next year, the Egyptians give him their livestock. They have no money left, so they pay for their grain with livestock. Their horses, flocks, cattle, donkeys, those are the things that are named in exchange for grain. And all the livestock goes to Pharaoh. The next year, they give their land to Joseph for grain, and all the land goes to Pharaoh. And they were told in these, those verses that Joseph then moves all the people into the cities, from out where they were living and on their land, he moves them into the cities of Egypt. And that's where the storage, the grain storage facilities were built in the cities. We were told that a couple weeks ago. 
After the seven years of famine, people are moved back out into the country. After the seven years of famine come to an end, the people are moved back out into the country. And then from that time on, they had to give one-fifth of their harvest to Pharaoh, and they could keep four-fifths of it for themselves and do with it whatever they wanted to do with it. And so now you think, how do people feel about this? That passage ends with the people thanking Joseph and telling him, you have saved our lives. When they get through that, that famine, and, and things are kind of leveling off. They go to Joseph, you saved our lives. That's how bad it was. They know they would have died if Joseph hadn't been there and did what he did. So Joseph was giving bread and life to the people, but to receive it, they had to give everything to Joseph. He's giving bread and life to the people, but in order to receive it, they had to give everything they had to Joseph. Jesus is giving bread and salvation and life to the people of this earth, but to get it, they must give everything to him. Their minds, their hearts, their loyalty, their love, their devotion, their very souls, everything goes to him. Joseph worked to gather all things in Egypt to Pharaoh. That's what he was doing. Through this process, everything came under Pharaoh. Jesus works to gather all things to God. He's doing this now, gradually, and he'll do it completely in the end. This is the whole process. Is Jesus with the church on the earth, scattered throughout the world, the church in every nation, preaching the gospel and bringing all people, working to bring all people under the authority of Christ. Everybody coming to Christ. As Matthew 28, I've shown it a lot because it's the mission statement for the church. And Jesus says, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, bring them under my authority, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And so this is what's going on right now. Jesus, through his church, is, is bringing people to him, bringing people to him. Now, it's interesting that we're told in 1 Corinthians 15 Christ is bringing everything together under himself, and then he's going to give it all to the Father. That, that's the idea. There's other passages uh, in the New Testament, too, that talk about that same thing. So just as Joseph was working to bring all of Egypt to him, everything to him, and then he gave it to Pharaoh, Jesus is bringing everything in the world, working to bring everything to him, and then he's going to give it to God the Father. And that's interesting because God created everything, right? Right? Genesis 1 and 2, God created everything. Everything's his, but then the rebellion happened in Genesis 3. And the rebellion continues to this day, the human race in rebellion against God. But everything will one day be brought back under God's authority. The rebellion is not going to last forever. Everything's going to be brought back under God's authority. Authority. So that what Joseph did in Egypt is a picture, it's an image of what Jesus is doing in this world, bringing everything under his authority, bringing everything to him, and then, and then he's going to give it all to the Father. All of this is heading toward a new earth, a new earth. This is not a small theme in the New Testament, it's a big one, that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and this is where this is all going. In the new earth, it's going to be like, this, it looks like, we don't know. I mean, God could do away with this earth and, and create a brand new one. But most people believe, and this is what I believe, that it's this earth renewed. After, there's two different types of purification methods in the Old Testament that God uses. Two purification rites. One is with water and one's with fire. Those are the two. Uh, the flood, Noah's flood, that was a purification rite. The earth had become wicked. We're told that. Um, and then God cleanses it with water. It's water purification. The next purification, right, and the whole New Testament talks about this over and over again, is going to be with fire. That there's going to be fire, this earth purified. After it's purified, it's the new earth. It's a new earth. After the water purification, when Noah got off that ark, he was on a new earth, a purified earth. Um, we're called new people after our baptism. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says that we are new creations. Well, it's still me. If you saw me, if, 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 you, if you saw me before I became a new creation, and then after I would look the same, but I'm new. Uh, and so I think the new earth is this earth purified. And, every, and it's going to be like one big garden of Eden where everything is in harmony with God again. 
In the garden, everything was in harmony with God and doing what God created it to do, even the humans. Um, but then that came to an end, but on the new earth, everything will be in harmony uh, to God and his ways again. One big garden of Eden, the whole earth, only righteousness is going to dwell on it, the Bible says. There's going to be no sin, no curse, no devil, no demons. All that is gone. So it's going to be really something. And Peter talks about that. And this, again, is the translation from, from Knox. I've read this passage to you a number of times from uh, other versions, but this is uh, Father Ronald Knox's version. It's just something different, a different way to hear it. The Lord is not being dilatory over his promise. He's not delaying about coming back, establishing his reign, his full reign upon the earth. As some think, he's only giving you more time because his will is that all of you should attain repentance, not that some should be lost. But the day of the Lord is coming, and when it comes, it will be upon you like a thief. The heavens will vanish in a whirlwind. The elements will be scorched up and dissolved. Earth and all the earth's achievements will burn away. All so transitory. And what men you ought to be. How unworldly in your life. How reverent toward God as you wait and wait eagerly for the day of the Lord to come. For the heavens to shrivel up in fire and the elements to melt in its heat. And meanwhile, we have new heavens and a new earth to look forward to. The dwelling place of holiness. That is what he has promised. Beloved, since these expectations are yours, do everything to make sure that he shall find you innocent, undefiled, at peace. All right. Uh, we're going to bring it in for a landing now with uh, verses 27 and following. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there, and they grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh. And this was like a shaking on something. This is a, You made a deal, made a covenant this way back in the day. Put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And Joseph said, I will do as you have said. And then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of his bed. Now, it's interesting. I, I was thinking about this. Just as Joseph spent the first 17 years of his life in the care of his father, because he was sold into slavery when he was 17, right? And now we're reading this, and we're told that Jacob spends 17 years in Egypt at the end of his life. So just as Joseph spent the first 17 years of his life in the care of his father, his father spends the final 17 years of his life in the care of Joseph. All right, so in conclusion tonight, it's an interesting passage of Scripture, and we'll pick up um, in Genesis next week. But I just want to say a couple of quick things. Life is a pilgrimage. We hear J Jacob say that. Yeah, he looked at life as a pilgrimage, not just as kind of being here existing, but as a pilgrimage. Through this life, through this earth, to another place, to the place Jesus has prepared for us. That's where we're heading. The pilgrimage is often filled with joy. There's a lot of joy on this, this trip that, that we're going on, this pilgrimage. But also it has seasons of sorrow and difficulty. And yet we keep on faithful and loyal and devoted to the one who loved us and died for us and is waiting on us. 